Hello, this is Rochelle Agatha, and this lecture is on bonds payable and investment in bonds and the presentation in financial statements. The objectives of this lecture are to compute the potential impact of long-term borrowing on earnings per share, describe the characteristics, terminology, and pricing of bonds payable, journalize entries for bonds payable, describe and illustrate the payment and redemption of bonds payable, and journalize entries for purchase, interest, discount, and premium amortization and sale of bond investments, and to prepare a corporate balance sheet. And let me just say that bonds payable are a more um, complex topic. It is covered, once again, it's one of the topics that's covered more in advanced accounting if you move on in, in accounting. Um, so this is just for you to understand the high level and to be able to do um, the basic journal entries. Okay, the first objective was computing the potential impact of long-term borrowing on earnings per share. So the whole point of bonds is, is it's debt incurred by a corporation um, when they ha need cash. A bond is simply a form of an interest-bearing note. Like a note, a bond requires periodic interest payments, and the face amount must be um, repaid at the maturity date. So big companies will go out and issue bonds, um, governments issue bonds, to get money for capital for the most part. So here's three different plans um, with, as you can see, different issuances, all adding up to $4 million. So plan one was just bonds, plan two was a mix of preferred stock and bonds, and plan three had common stock, preferred stock, and bonds. And as you know from the previous lectures, um, we talked about earnings per share, so this shows you the different plans and what happens to the earnings per share on common stock. So companies have to keep this in mind and the point of this discussion in this lecture is just for you to understand there are lots of ways for companies to get financing and here's just an overview of what it does to the bottom line and to the earnings per share of a company and here's another um, piece of the example with the same three plans um, if they had 440,000 of earnings <coughs> so Okay, let's talk about Gonzalez companies considering the following alternative plans for financing their company. A 10% bond issuance or common stock at $10. Income tax is estimated at 40% of income. So you want to determine the earnings per share of common stock under the two alternative financing plans, assuming income before bond interest and income tax is $750,000. So under plan one, you're going to come up with an earnings per share on common stock of $1.50 because you have your earnings before the interest and income tax of $7.50. You get your income tax taken off the $7.50 and then you get your earnings per share. Under plan two, you have bond interest, so that negates your um, earnings. And then you pay income tax on a lesser amount, so you actually have a higher earnings per share. So as you can see, having the um, this scenario here brought your taxable income down. So once again, just I want you to just understand this from a high level and just get the point that different financing plans affect the earnings per share on common stock. Okay, let's describe the characteristics and terminology and, of, and pricing of bonds. A corporation that issues bonds enters into a contract called a bond indenture or trust indenture with the bondholders. Usually the face value of each bond is called the principal. It is a thousand or a multi thousand dollars or multiples of thousands of dollars. Interest on bonds may be payable annually, semi-annually, or quarterly. Most pay interest semi-annually. The reason people buy bonds is to get the interest, so that's why there's people. Um, that's why there is a demand for bonds because of that interest. When all bonds of an issue mature at the same time, they are called term bonds. If the maturity dates are spread over several dates, they are called serial bonds. Bonds that may be exchanged for other securities are called convertible bonds. So you're going to hear a lot of terms in this um, lecture. Bonds that a corporation reserves the right to redeem before their maturity are called callable bonds. And bonds issued on the basis of the general credit of the corporation are called debenture bonds. So when a corporation issues bonds, the price that buyers are willing to pay depends upon three factors. The face amount of the bonds, which is the amount due at maturity date, the periodic interest to be paid on the bonds, this is called the contract rate or the coupon rate. That's the amount that the, peop the people that buy the bonds are going to get. And the market or effective rate of interest. The market or effective rate of interest is determined by transactions between buyers and sellers of similar bonds. The market rate of interest is affected by various factors. 
investors' assessment of current economic conditions, future expectations, and just so you know, it's just like stock trading on the stock exchange. It is based on a lot of factors, the economy, the, the demand, and bonds are the same way. They, they are affected the same way. So we'll go through some examples. The, if the market rate equals the contract rate, this, and the selling price of a bond is 1000 um, if the contract rate and the market rate are the same, the bonds sell at their face value. If the market rate is greater than the contract rate, it sells at a discount. So the selling price of the bond is less than, than the face amount. If the market rate is less than the contract rate the selling and the selling price of the bond then is greater than a thousand then it's said it's sold at a premium so for now you're just I would print all these slides out um, and just go back through them after you listen to the lecture because it will make more sense after you go through some of the examples the time value of money concept recognizes that an amount of cash to be received today is worth more than that same amount to, of cash to be received in the future so simply put a dollar today is not going to be worth what it will be worth in a few years. So we need to understand the present value of money to do bonds. So a thousand dollar 10 percent bond is purchased. It pays interest annually and will mature in two years. Okay, here's your basic scenario. Um, now with computers you can do this in the computer but for visualization I'm going to show you a chart. So what this is saying is that if you have a two-year term bond and you have a 10% rate, the factor you're going to use is this 0.82645. This is a present value chart. And once again, if you have a computer and you use Excel, which we do in the Excel um, class, you can do this through a calculation. But for this class, I'm showing you that for a two year period of time at a 10% rate, this is the factor that we're going to use. So let's go through this example. So we're saying that a thousand dollars in due in two years is only worth eight hundred and twenty six forty five today because there's that thousand dollars times that factor from the previous slide. So that is present value. So you have eight twenty six forty five today and in two years that becomes a thousand dollars. So um, Referring that as Exhibit 3, let's test our knowledge. We have 4000 to be received in five years. If the market rate is 10%, you're going to go back to that chart, and you're going to see that the factor is 0 0.62092. So $4,000 in five years is really worth 2483 today at 10%. Okay, so make sure you can go back and track that on the chart. Okay, so let's do um, a present value of a periodic bond payment. So here we have $100 at the end of year one, and then $100 at the end of year two. So you bring each piece back. Um, this one is $90 and $82.64, and then you add them up, and it's $173. So you can bring each payment back separately. There's also the present value of an annuity. So what an annuity is, is if you're going to get the same amount of payment over time, you can use this chart to calculate the present value of an annuity. So keep this, remember this chart is here as we go through the examples when you print them out. Okay, so let's do present value of a two-year 10% bond. Face amount 1,000, due in two years at 10%. So here's our 82,645. Then we have present value of two annual interest payments compounded annually. That's where you go to exhibit four and pull that that amount and then you add them up and there's your thousand dollars. So the best way to learn this is to go back and walk through these examples before you try your homework. Let's do another one. Calculate the present value of 20,000 five percent five-year bond that pays a thousand interest annually. If the market rate of interest is five percent use the two exhibits to calculate. So you have your present value of your twenty thousand due in five years so you find your factor of 0.78353 and then you have your present value of five annual interest payments of a thousand dollars at five percent going from the present value of an annuity chart and you add the two together and there's your twenty thousand dollars so bonds are made up of the present value of the amount due and the present value of the annuity payments all brought back 
to current period. Objective three, let's journalize entries for bonds payable. So on January 1, a corporation issues for cash 100,000 of 12% five-year bonds, interest payable semi-annually. The market rate is 12%. Okay, so the market rate and the contract rate are the same. So we calculate the present value of the face amount of 100,000 due in five years, and then we calculate the present value of the 10 interest payments and we get the total present value of the bond. So you need those pieces to do the journal entry. So here's our journal entry. There's our 100,000 cash, our bonds payable, because they were issued at the face amount. Then you have your interest payment of 6,000 is made. Remember the interest rate is based on the coupon rate or the stated rate on the bond. Then the bond matured on December 31 at this time the corporation paid the face amount to the bondholders so the bond goes away and you pay cash okay so that was where the market rate and the contract rate were the same now let's assume that the market rate of interest is 13 percent on the hundred thousand bonds rather than 12 percent so what would be the present value of these bonds okay so now we have a market rate greater than the the contract rate so here, notice we use the, the market rate to find the present value. So you do the same calculation, but we picked up the market rate. Notice now the present value of the bonds is less than, than the um, contract rate. So do you remember what that's called? Okay, so it was discounted. The bonds were sold at a discount. See, right here. So hopefully that makes sense, more sense than from the beginning. So now we book our cash. We only get cash of 96406. We have a discount on bonds payable, and then there's our bonds. So when the market rate is greater than the contract rate, the bonds are sold at a discount. Then on the first day of the fiscal year, the company issued a million dollar 6% five-year bonds that paid semi-annual interest, receiving cash of 845562. Journalize the entry. Okay, notice here that you only got cash of less than, than the stated amount of the bonds. So we're just going to do another example. Cash, there's our discount, and there's our bonds. So there's another example where you didn't actually have to figure it out. The problem told you what you sold them at. There are two methods of amortizing bond discount. So just like depreciation, you have to amortize a bond discount or a premium and recognize it over the life of the bond. So you can amortize a bond discount by the straight line method or the effective interest rate method. Straight line is almost like um, depreci straight line depreciation. Both methods amortize the same total amount of discount over the life of the bonds. So here we have on June 30th, six months interest is paid and the bond discount is amortized using the straight line method. So you recognize interest expense and you reduce your discount on bonds payable. So you are taking your bonds payable and you are um, ex expensing it over the life of the bond so that at the end of the term of the bond the discount is gone so it's expense to you um, here's our interest expense and our discount on bonds payable and our cash paid interest and amortize the bond discount over the straight line method so there's the journal entry if the market rate of interest is 11 percent and the contract rate is 12 percent then it sells for a premium. So the market rate is less than the contract rate. You have a premium. So here's our example. You use the, the rate that you, the market rate is what you use in the present value calculation. Notice here is the amount. It's sold at a premium, 103769 So here's how we book it. Now we have a premium on bonds payable. Then we're going to journalize um, the interest payment. Same kind of thing. Here's your um, cash, your premium on bonds payable, and there's your bonds payable. So there's the um, initial journal entry. Then you're going to pay the semi-annual interest and amortize the premium. So here's your interest expense. And that's how you get it on the straight line. And then there's your cash. So you, every time you make an interest payment, you have to do the um, amortization of the premium. Using the bond from the previous example, journalize the first interest payment. So here's our first interest payment shows you the straight line method. Then there's something called zero coupon bonds that don't provide for an interest 
um, payment, only the face amount is paid at maturity, so assume the market rate is 13%. So the present value of 100,000 due in five years at 13% compounded semi-annually um, is 53,273. So you have to book, get the journal e up, the discount on bonds payable and the cash and the bonds payable. So you still calculate that discount for a zero coupon bond. So just keep in mind there are some bonds that don't have an interest, so you, you still do the present value and impute that discount or premium. Objective four was describe and illustrate the payment and redemption of bonds payable. Since the payment of bonds normally involves a large amount of cash, a bond indenture may require that cash be periodically transferred into a special fund called a sinking fund over the life of the bond. A corporation may call or redeem bonds before they mature. Callable bonds can be redeemed by the issuing corporation within the period of time and the price stated in the bond indenture. Normally the call price is above the face value. So if you issue bonds, you keep a reserve, if you will, called a sinking fund, so that if, and if you have callable bonds, then you can buy them back. So an example is, on June 30th, a corporation has a bond issue of 100000 outstanding on which there is an unamortized premium of 4000 The corporation purchased one-fourth of the bonds for 24000 So they take the bonds off their books and the premium, and they pay the cash. And they actually have a gain on redemption because they retired the bonds for 24000 Instead, assume that on June 30th, the corporation calls all of the bonds paying 105. So the bonds come off the books, the premium has to come off the books for what was it was on the books for. Then they actually have a loss because they had to pay 105. So depending on what the, the bonds are on your books for, you might end up with a loss or a gain when you call um, bonds and buy them back. A $500,000 bond issue on which there is an unamortized discount of $40,000 is redeemed for $475,000. Journalize the redemption. So you have your discount comes off your books, you paid $475,000, the bonds come off your books, and the difference is your loss. This, I think this example is easier to see just because it's all sitting here on one slide. So once again, you will have a loss or a gain depending on what you call the bonds back for and what they were sitting on your books for. Just like if you buy or sell you know, your fixed assets and you're, they're on your books and the net book value might be less than or greater than what you're selling it for and you had a gain or a loss, it's the same concept. Objective five is journalize entries for the purchase interest discount and premium amortization and sale of bond investments. Bonds may be purchased either directly from the issuing corporation or through an organized bond exchange. Prices for bonds are quoted as percentage of the face amount. So here's an example where on April two, 2007, investor purchased a, a thousand Lewis Company bond at 102 plus a brokerage fee. Notice that um, you include the um, investment includes that brokerage fee, and you have interest revenue, and you paid a cash of 1035 Note the brokerage fee is added to the cost of the investment. Here, Crenshaw purchases 50000 of 8% bonds of Dietz Corporation due in eight and three-quarter years. The effective interest rate is 11%, so the rate, effective rate is greater than the contract rate. The purchase price is 41 sold at a discount, so you have to book your entry. You bought an investment in deets, you have interest revenue, and you paid forty two seven oh six. So you peop, the people that buy the bonds, this is what it looks like on their books. Crenshaw received semi-annual interest for um, April 1st to October, so they have six months of 50,008%, so they get 2,000 interest revenue. Remember, you buy the bond to get the interest, so this is an investment on Crenshaw's books. Adjusting entry for interest accrued from October 1 to December 31. So you have to accrue, even though the payments fall every six months, you must book an accrual. This is an adjusting entry. So we're adding to our vocabulary of adjusting entry. So we would book interest receivable and interest revenue through December 31, even though a payment wasn't due. And then um, the adjusting entry for amortization of the discount, you also have to do that. You get interest revenue for the discount if you're the bond, per, the person that bought the bond as the investment. So there's a lot going on in bonds, but I think if you can just equate it very similarly to fixed assets, as far as journal entries go, it won't confuse you as much. You do the same type of, of journal entries as far as concept goes. 
The effect of these entries on interest revenues is follows. So here's the T accounts. You can see the, in, the interest revenue. Um, these bonds are sold for $47,350 plus accrued interest on June 2014. The carrying amount of the bond is the $47,868, which is the $41,706 plus $79 per month times 78 months of interest. So once the, when they go to sell it, they have their investment in deeds and their interest revenue. So first they have to record six months of interest. The next slide shows the account after the amortization entries have been made. So here's your all those little amortization entries. And then the investment is sold. So if you print these slides out and you walk through them, you'll you, you can make sure you can go through the steps. It's it's just like I mentioned, any investment, you're gonna true it up before you sell it and that's all you're doing here is truing it up and making sure you're recognizing your revenue in you know your interest income earned appropriately on the accrual basis not on the cash basis so here's another example um, when you print these slides out you can walk through I tried to give you a lot of examples just to help you objective six prepare the corporate balance sheet so this is what it looks like when you have um, you know you're used to your normal cash section if you have investments now of bonds they show up as a longer term asset and then on the um, stockholders side down here if you've um, you know you've got your common stock your paid in capital and here's your long-term liabilities with your bonds so if you invest in bonds they're in your long-term assets if you sell bonds they're in your long-term liabilities Investments in bonds or other debt securities that management intends to hold to their maturity are called held to maturity securities. Such securities are classified as long-term investments. These investments are reported at their cost less amor um, any amortized premium or plus any amortized discount. The market value of the bond investment should be disclosed either on the face of the balance sheet or in the notes. Some corp okay, and then there's one little analysis, ratio analysis that I just want to mention. Some corporations have a high ratio of debt to stockholders' equity. For such corporations, analysts often assess the relative risk if their debt to um, equity ratio is too high. So they, there's a couple of them, but the one I'm mentioning here is the number of times the interest charge is um, earned. So you take your interest expense, um, you have your income before income tax plus your interest expense divided by your interest expense. So here's this example and it's um, the number of times interest charges are earned is 5.73. So each industry will have a, um, a ratio comparison, if you will, you can compare yourself on your times interest earned. So this ratio indicates that the debt holders have adequate protection against a potential drop in earnings jeopardizing their receipt of interest payments. So that's a high level analysis. So I know that was a lot. We talked about financing, different types of financing compared to them. We talked about bond terms and characteristics, time value of money, accounting for bonds, investment in bonds, and financial statement presentation. So um, if you have any questions when you're doing your homework, let me know. Thanks.